Let's go. <laughs> hey, everybody behind the How stage, make some noise. Everyone in the back, come to the front. Everyone in the front, take a seat. <laughs> All right, I'm super excited. Um, I guess you guys should just come up. Brett, Ellie, Nick, Rex, let's do it. Let's run it. Welcome to Data in the Creator Economy. <laughs> Super hyped to be here, fired up. Awesome lineup we got with us. Um, everyone's an expert in their own respect uh, from the creator economy, data, tokenizing media, so many subjects to talk about, Web3 social, all the buzzwords. So I think a good place to start, guys, is a quick intro. I'll give a quick intro on myself. My name is Adam. I host the podcast Mint, co-founder of Bello. Uh, Bello is building data tools for creators in Web3, and with me, I got my co-founder, Ellie, but we'll get to her in a minute. Brett, Ellie, we'll take it away. Give yourself a quick intro. Hey, everyone. I'm Brett. I uh, co-founded Palm Tree Crew Crypto, which is an early stage creator economy focused crypto fund. Uh, Palm Tree Crew is Kygo's lifestyle brand, so Kygo's my partner as well, and uh, we invest in early stage awesome companies like Bello. GM. Hey guys, I'm Ellie. I am a full stack Web3 engineer and the co founder and CTO of Bello, building for creators and big advocate for all things data transparency and excited to talk today. Hey guys, I'm Nick. Uh, I manage operations at Glass, a video NFT marketplace. Um, yeah, I'm super excited to be chatting with these people. Is that? Hey guys, I'm Rex uh, and I'm CEO of a company called Famecast. We're an all-in-one creator operating system, and we also operate a creator accelerator in Santa Monica. We hosted the hackathon this week, um, and uh, we help creators uh, build their businesses and manage it. All right, so experts in their own respect. I like to kind of get uh, some taste from the audience really quick. How many people here are creators themselves? Why show of hands? One, two, three, okay. How many of you guys uh, minted an NFT before? Like, what's the audience, okay? How many of you guys collected NFTs? Okay. How many NFTs, 100 NFTs? Less than 100, okay. 200? 300? <laughs> 1,000? <000? laughs> okay, cool. So I'd just like to get a primer for who's, who, who we're speaking to, just to kind of get an idea of, of the complexity of the conversation. Um, I think a good place to start, guys, is understanding the current state of the Web3 creator economy as we know it. Um, we're in the bear market right now. Creators are still creating. Tokens are still being minted. We're seeing different asset classes sort of form for music, photography, podcasts, and so much more. How would you guys explain the current state of the creator economy today in Web3? We can start with Brett and then work our way down. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's definitely overall very early. Um, I think, you know, what is the creator economy? It's kind of like, I guess, you know, thinking about different verticals of content is kind of how I would start. Um, so you've seen things like crypto art, you have music NFTs, video NFTs, podcasts, writing, uh, and there's a bunch of different companies and different kind of shared infrastructure being built across all of that. Um, yeah, I think like we've all kind of seen the big Beeple sale. So crypto art has seen a pretty big adoption already. Uh, and then when you kind of go beyond art, music has been a bit more of a kind of, there was like $30 million in volume last year in music NFTs in comparison to like, you know, a couple billion in 2021 for crypto art. Um, so that's still early, but definitely bigger than, you know, videos maybe in more in the million. You have like writing in around a million. So these other like areas are starting to be created and bubbled up and, and uh, you know, there's apps and platforms starting to be built for that. That's kind of how I'd break down the current landscape. Ellie, how, how would you explain the current state of the creator economy right now? Yeah, I think, I think Brett touched on a lot of, a lot of really good things. Um, I think it's definitely, we're at a stage of tons of different experimentations happening both on the creative side of what, what creators are building, but also on the technology side of how we are actually implementing and utilizing NFTs. And so I think you know, over the course of the past several years, we've seen a ton of different manifestations and optimizations to allow uh, di different forms of digital ownership. So very early, but very experimentative and trying new ideas and kind of seeing what sticks. Sure. Nick? I totally agree with that. I think one other thing that um, has really stood out for us recently has been collaboration and like co-creation as being a really important driver of how new content and new, new creations are made. 
Um, so I was with, and that kind of ties into the experimentation too, you know, like trying to find, there's no really winning formula that like everybody kind of follows or does, you know, it's like very unique. Each, every NFT that gets made, every drop, everything is like kind of its own little world, you know, and I, I love that part about it. So that's what I would add is the collaboration aspect. And, and Rex, how would you say the, the current state of the creator economy looks like today? Uh, I think it's, so we're seeing it evolve from, yeah, just art and apes to experiential uh, as well as digital. Uh, so we do a lot of, we help creators create their merch lines and we can incorporate like NFTs, for example, through like smart chips that connect to the merch uh, and then create that as an experiential. So like, for example, with a musician we're working with, he's getting ready to launch a record. Uh, if you get the NFT, which is beyond what the, the regular, let's say, 12 o'clock release is, uh, at 10 o'clock, you get to get into the watch party. Uh, the, the product is incorporated with a chip that's connected to an NFT. That's a membership. That ties into experiential. So I think that's where it's going, is kind of this experience uh, and tying that whole membership experience access type of piece into the NFT and then drawing from that to create like royalty, smart contracts, different things that can come off of that. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I want to talk about sort of um, the Web 2 creator and the Web 3 creator. Um, and I want to bring up this conversation because we see a lot of experiments of people trying to bridge Web 2 revenue with Web 3 or strictly taking a Web 3 approach strategy to growing a creator base or a collector base. How do you guys see like the optimal strategy for Web 2 artists making their way into Web 3? And Rex, we could, we could start with you because I know you have this accelerator that you work with a lot of creators. Yeah, in fact, we're really a Web2 company that mingles things because creators are interested in Web3. They're interested in Metaverse. They're interested in uh, NFTs. Uh, and at the same time, 98% of our revenue comes from Web2. So, you know, it's the memberships. It's, it's content. Uh, and so it's trying to bridge the two together. And, and like I said before, it's like creating these experiential connections and access uh, where we can use NFTs as a bridge. Uh, and honestly, on the consumer side, it's how to get that in there without saying, oh, you need a wallet or you need this. It's just kind of that seamless experience that if you can create it, it, it will just naturally happen. Nick, I know Glass has had a quite of interesting journey from moving from Ethereum to Solana, now back to Ethereum, um, and working with all sorts of creators to tokenize video content. When you go and approach a Web2 content creator on YouTube, you're like, you guys should tokenize your stuff on Glass. You should make, like, what is the optimal approach to onboarding those people into the industry, you think? I think a big part of it comes from, or, or a, like one of the main things that I think we try to get creators to understand when we want to work with them is that we'll, what we're developing is kind of a medium for telling stories. It's not, it's really something that, it's like a tool that you can use that is used to then further the experience of your creative work. And so I think it went from that foundation of something that it's like, okay, here's similar, think like I would say it's similar to like a piece of paper and a pen where you can like write a story, you can use the crypto and like the Web3 creator ecosystem as kind of like a canvas for that. I think finding people that match that perspective and kind of have that vision for it, it makes it a lot easier to try to onboard and, and get, you know, because because creators do want to tell stories, you know, like that's ultimately what they're what they're about. So I think proposed like presenting it as like a tool for enabling that and, and new ways of like hearing those stories and understanding and and connecting with the artists really resonates with creators at least we found brett i know i know you're behind a lot of like really successful creators in web3 whether from a collection perspective or even just onboarding web2 native artists into web3 figuring out their community base and then taking them launching them off from that point on when you think about like the optimal strategy for organically entering the Web3 space, what comes to mind? Yeah, I think, you know, in the current state where it's definitely pretty early and, like, most people that are, like, participating are basically it's collectors and artists is, like, the two sides of it. So from a collector base, like, what do we have right now and, like, how many collectors are there that, you know, use MetaMask or understand the concept of NFTs or collecting content? Maybe they've collected crypto art. Maybe now they're buying music. Um, you know, that's kind of the market, uh, the demand that we're dealing with right now. And so I think it works really well for newer, like kind of next gen artists, like artists that are just kind of getting started, getting into the, into the space, because they can really kind of fully commit to it and embrace the earliness of the ecosystem. 
Uh, so I think it works really well for that. And then I'm really excited to see over time as like these markets, these different content markets grow and more volume comes to these different spaces as like basically more values unlocked across music and podcasts and writing that, you know, you get to see um, artists that look at it and see, oh, wow, that market actually could sustain and value my work more than it already is in the current system. I'm going to kind of opt in over there and start to figure it out. And I think we'll see like more lower priced, more high additions, better user experience, and things really start to scale for the next mainstream audience. Elliot, and I know you yourself, I mean, you're very technical, very talented at what you do, but you also have an experience of actually managing musicians, right? And between you and I, we talked to a lot of creators. I'm curious, when you have conversations with creators and they want to make their way into Web3, they want to figure out the right strategy for launching their content, finding their collector base, what tend to be sort of like those initial misconceptions that kind of like act as red flags for them that you try to clear up in the air? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, bringing in, I guess specifically for me, like working with, me, talking to musicians or people that I've known for the music industry coming in to Web3, um, I think that that for me, I, at least with like what we're doing at Bello, there's, there's so much information out there that already exists that creators can leverage if they're trying to join in into use, utilizing a new technology. Um, and so I think something that I found really interesting is like how can we show them the the communities that are that these uh, individuals are a part of leveraging on-chain data to allow them to kind of get a better oversight because when you're coming into Web3 you, you start hearing all these buzz terms you start hearing all these things you have like no idea really where to start um, maybe you see a, a music artist out there or if you're a different type of creator uh, artist etc and you kind of looked at them maybe you start following them on, on Twitter. Um, but you don't really know much more than that. And I think something that I'm really proud that we've been able to do at Bello is say that like not only can you go follow that person on Twitter, but you can actually understand who their collectors are and you can understand who their communities are by like searching those NFT contracts. And so I think in general, it's just about like giving more awareness to them, like having them sort of ease into a seeing um, on social media where these different accounts live, et cetera, um, building for that way. Go ahead. And I'll add on to that. I mean, I think, like, you know, it's super important to be able to get data out of what's going on in the ecosystem to understand, you know, how to make good decisions. Like, think about it. I think about it from my perspective, from, like, the VC side. I want to understand how these protocols are performing. Like, people go, like, you know, analysts and stuff will go to do an analytics and write these queries and try to figure out, oh, is this protocol has volume, how many people are collecting on it, all this kind of information to make a good decision from like an investment perspective, right? Um, and I think like that same exact type of information is really important for a creator, but I don't, we can't really expect a creator to write SQL, right? So how do you kind of go in and say, all right, who are all the collectors that overlap with what I like to release and you know, what are they collecting and how much are they buying it for and kind of pull all that data and surface it in a way that you can make really good decisions as a creator is a super important tool. Go, go ahead, Edel. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, to kind of add to what you had asked earlier about like the comparison between the Web 2 world and the Web 3 world, I think this idea around data for creators in the Web 2 world is something that, you know, is talked about and it's frustrations, but not, I think, to the volume that like creators truly understand how much of their information is owned by the platforms that they, dis they disperse content onto. So if you're an artist making music on Spotify or SoundCloud or YouTube, or you're doing TikTok videos, like you're kind of like just the mo every, every piece of content you put out is just like making them more profit, really. And you know, you might see a little bit of the stream come through, you might see a little bit of, of the revenue come at, at some point, but at the end of the day, like you're feeding their business model, right? And in Web3, you are your own business. You are your own business model. You have the, the leverage and ability to go out and create your own brand, all of this stuff. And with that, now you aren't gated by the Web2 platform's data that they have on you. You have the data on yourself. And so with that comes a new need for a shift of tooling and availability around the data that is out there. So Spotify doesn't own your NFT data. YouTube doesn't own your NFT data. You own your NFT data, and what is so important now at this stage of crypto, of, of while it's so still so complex, and the 
the way in which like like you were just saying with like SQL, like it's pretty unpractical to say, yes, you own your data, but like you have to learn how to code to be able to get it. No creator, most creators are not gonna wanna do that. And so I think building for a future where creators can truly own the content they create and own the data and distribution and all kind of pieces of it along the way is really important. Rex, you and I, we were having a conversation off stage. You were yep. sort of explaining to me something that excites you at, at, at your company is sort of explaining the difference between the Web 2 side and the Web 3 side to the creators that you work with and these gated silos that people publish content on, right? They elaborate on that for a minute. Yeah, so I mean, we've built tools that we kind of call ourselves a creator operating system. So a lot of it is helping them manage these Web2 platforms, but um, but the, the key is that, yeah, like she was saying, the data, they are living on third-party platforms. They could get shadow banned. They could get, you know, they could get uh, canceled, right? So the key is that they have to be able to collect their data. And what's important is, like, right now, a lot of creators, influencers, they make their money on things like brand deals. At the same time, they, I don't know of too many creators that can tell the brands, like, what, how did I do? I posted this story on Instagram. What did I do? And so we've been trying to build data tools in the back to collect even, like, like what getting your data from these platforms, you need to be able to program. Well, they don't know how to do that, so we kind of give tools to kind of connect them to their data and then pull that into a, a place. And we're working on something where then that goes on chain, right, so that, let's say, a brand could come in and actually be able to access that data, see it, Right. And so if you're doing an Instagram story, now you have data behind it. Uh, and you have all this other data that you can pick up. Uh, and you could do this pretty easily with different things. Like as an example, if you did a giveaway on Instagram, that drives people to something that you now control. Now you're collecting lists and data. And now as you're collecting that, you can, you know, a creator that is armed with that kind of data can go back to brands and can get a lot more money than they're getting right now. Uh, and you can build that into, you know, uh, these smart contracts that basically can come in and, and help creators monetize their data better. So I think let's zoom out for a second because what you're explaining is a really cool model that I talk a lot about on the podcast. When you think about the Web3 creator economy today, you have to sort of zoom out and think about it like this. Creators use Web2 platforms to build distribution and virality. And when they're more crypto native, they use Web3 to capture that value. So there's a constant bridge between those two worlds to kind of build audiences that, that attract virality, that can distribute the messages of an NFT drop, and then linking them to a smart contract platform, whether it be Glass, Sound, Zora, whatever these platforms are, to actually mint the NFTs and to capture more of that value. But now I feel like we're, we're transitioning into a new world, the era of Web3 social, right? Crypto native social where, and this may be a hot take, but my bet is your community of collectors will surpass your community of followers. Right, so as you build viral audiences, right, they're going to be sort of kind of like measured by what they've collected from you versus what they've liked, what they have viewed, and so on and so on and so forth. So I'd like to sort of transition the conversation into Web3 Social because I think what you were alluding to earlier, Rex, and, and Ellie's like, when you build audiences, you can get shadow banned, right? And there goes your entire account. Or if a new platform pops up, like let's say in 2018 when TikTok started getting its moment, all the Instagram creators kind of became MIA and TikTok creators became the new thing. It becomes less of a problem when you build audiences via collectors in Web3. So let's transition the conversation into the topic of Web3 social, just to kind of like share some general thoughts. Brett, I know you've been vocal about this lately, collecting content, talking about building audiences on chain. Any quick thoughts to share on this? Yeah, I think what's going on in the NFT space right now, we're collectors are collecting or valuing content from their favorite creators or from creators they appreciate their content um, is already the beginning of a very social experience. I mean, the relationships being developed are much more beyond anything we have in Web 2 in comparison to like following someone on Instagram or liking a photo. Those don't really carry that much value or don't differentiate one fan, one person in the audience from the other. Versus now in the NFT space, how much do you actually care about that artist and kind of create that signal that the artist can notice and appreciate you back? Uh, so I think in the future, as this is a much bigger space, running up to your favorite artist and saying, I was the first one to follow you. I love your music since the beginning, like is much less of a reality where it's like, you probably already know each other. You're probably invited, you know, you're in the right spot. You're being taken care of the right way. 
not necessarily just in IRL experiences, but just more of like as an example. Um, and I think Web3 Social is just like, how do you show off all these relationships that are being created in this NFT, in this ecosystem of owning content, of collecting your favorite creators and, appreci and showing off your appreciation for them? Uh, so I'm excited for platforms that visualize and make it more clear what kind of relationships are being formed, that it actually is really valuable what's going on. Uh, and then also things like Lens, for example, where Adam is maybe the most followed creator on Lens. Shout out Adam Levy. Arguably. Yeah. I mean, it's really impressive. It's past his Twitter followers at this point. So I'm all in on Lens now. <laughs> I love um, that. But yeah, Lens is also actually adding more data constantly. Like, so I think whenever something is putting more content, more data on chain for the creator, it's adding to that, like, relationship social graph that's being built um you know whether even if it's just like the equivalent of a tweet that someone ends up collecting it's it's creating more context for people to realize and view relationships around so i'm excited about it really quick just to kind of pull the audience again how many of you guys are on tiktok okay so when you and how many of you guys have a crypto wallet okay so when i sort of think about the mental model of collectible content the same action that goes into liking a video on TikTok and it being added to your favorites folder is sort of the same mentality of collecting something and it being added into your wallet, right? But the cool thing about that, the way I sort of think about it, and Rex, this is back to what you were saying, like brand deals are still a big part of a creator's revenue. When I build an audience on chain, there's so much information that I can tap into to understand what other communities are my collectors a part of, go to those communities, figure out really cool collaborations, and cross-pollinate together. This is something I can't really do efficiently in the Web2 world, and I've done this. I, I bring podcast sponsors, right? I find the people, because I give out free NFTs to my listeners, I see who, what other communities are my collectors a part of, I go to those brands, and I try to do activations on-chain accordingly because, wait a minute, we already have overlapping audiences, I could probably cross-pollinate and get value, and you could probably cross-pollinate for my community and get value. Right, so just to kind of give like an off off the bat example of like the depth of this data and the value that kind of gets accrued to the creator. But yeah, on the on the topic of Web three social, Ellie, any any quick thoughts into what you're seeing in that space? Yeah, I I think the the kind of two main frontiers that we're seeing in the Web three sp social space is this idea of creating a profile and this idea of either collecting this content on chain or off chain. So what we just talked a ton about was Lens Protocol, where Lens right now. Uh, allows you to create a profile and everything that you quote unquote like or retweet, whatever, is all collected to your wallet. Uh, there is a, the other side of this Web3 social, which some of you guys probably have used or, or heard of, is called Farcaster, where you still have this digital identity stored, like tied to your social uh, uh, account, but all of the collection is just kind of the same way that you would do on Twitter. And I've been talking a lot about the kind of differences between the two, and I'm not saying I, I think one will win or the other. They're definitely two different use cases that I'm curious to see which a mass consumer actually adopts. Um, but the thing that is the same about both of these are this like digital identity that goes with you. And I think this concept alone, regardless of what you're collecting from it, is so huge and so monumental to what we've already seen in the past like five years or so even more with the centralized control of social media platforms and sort of how, how little effort it takes for them to snap their fingers and you be gone. And I think that that's something that, you know, you exist in the real world. There's, there's no situation in the real world where someone can just like make you invisible. And yet we, we spend so much of our lives interacting digitally and we give the power to people to say, no, you don't exist anymore. And I think the, the more that we can build for this future, whether it's through NFTs or through digital social profiles, whatever it may be, that you truly own, I think ownership all the way, data ownership, social ownership is gonna be the only way that we allow for a future where we own who we are, right. truly. And this is a great transition into Glass because when people think of Glass, they think about the Web3 YouTube, right? And earlier, Nick, you talked about NFTs acting as tools. So the biggest sort of difference when I think of YouTube and I think of Glass and the creators and how they publish content, and I think Jacob Horn from Zora said this best. It's like people have been publishing on the blockchain, except it's been YouTube's blockchain. So the same concept is that when you publish content on Glass, you just have more control, more autonomy, and more say into how that content can sort of be evolved. 
honed. Exactly. Leveraged. Yeah. Exactly. And I think the big thing for us, and you were mentioning this a little bit before, is just like the portability of those audiences and being able to connect and, and bring them to new experiences on different platforms, different projects, you know, that have maybe have nothing to do with Glass, um, you know, and but like al allowing Glass to be a piece of that ecosystem of distribution and of, of you know, connection with the audience, because that's ultimately what I think people are, are interested in developing, you know, so. I think that's a great example because that's, that's like a core primitive, like building interoperable audiences. So I can build now an audience on sound, on glass, on lens, and all these other platforms. And wherever I go, my community follows me. So it's not like I need to create these convoluted funnels to transfer a user from Instagram to TikTok and then back from TikTok to Twitter. It's all seamless. As long as I have ways to communicate to them, I can own my distribution, I can own my value capture, and so goes with my community following me everywhere I go. So it's like a very, uh, I feel like it's a very zero to one sort of uh, innovation here. Rex, I'm curious if you have anything to say on the, on the topic of Web3 Social. Yeah, I mean, for, for us, we look at it as, because uh, we're an operating system, we see what the creators are doing, and we're looking at it from the lens of helping them monetize. So we kind of look at it as, uh, like one of the projects we have is kind of creating, I'll call it a credit score for the creator. Uh, because for a brand, it's, they're thinking, are the clicks real? Are the views real? Right. And because we can see all that, we can do it. And on that data, you can build different things. Uh, for example, we run a lot of their merch, so we can see all this data on e-commerce, as an example. And let's say that we're also trying to, to incubate these creators as brands and businesses. And so the idea there is that you could use some of this credit score as a basis for, for example, crowdfunding, right. right? Where you could, so if somebody's saying, oh, I want to invest in this creator, I think they're doing great, uh, but is their business real? Is the data real? And by doing that on-chain, we can basically have this kind of immutable ledger of, of them and what they're doing. Uh, and then that can go into what we believe, you know, moving forward is like a crowdfunding model where basically they can go in your investment model is tied to a smart contract that basically ties to the investment and you see, if you're an investor, you see the data and what it's doing. Uh, and if they promised you a return, it basically can guarantee that return based on the, what the contract says. And so I think that's where we're seeing it going, but we're much about kind of the business plumbing of how a creator works and, and being able to take the data from all their different platforms. And because we're helping them really in Web2 platforms to kind of push their content, create their content, manage their content. We can then take all that data if they opt into that, and they will because, hey, I want to raise money. I want to get brand deals. Well, I'm going to be much more credible than the, than the guy or girl that doesn't do that. And that's kind of where we see tying in you know, Web3 into the creator economy. I love it. And I would love to take it a step further, too, because when you build an audience on a sort of open social graph where you own more of your data and you think about crypto as a whole being Lego blocks to one another and you just continuously build experiences on a protocol and that gets built on top of another protocol and so on and so on and so forth. Imagine being able to take your social graph that you built on Lens, for example, and being able to take a loan on Aave based off how good your social reputation is, right? So now you're, you're entering a whole new world of finance, whole new world of, of building audiences, a whole new world of reputation that just doesn't exist in Web2 because right now we're dependent on the credit system, right? And you have to have a good credit score to take out loans from the bank. And you have to play by the rules, play by the game to ultimately get out of the rat race. But I don't know, there's a... But even, yeah, even, go ahead. even imagine if uh, your content that you create, um, like what piece of content, that NFT, has, carries enough value to be able to take a loan out against that. Wow, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's really not that far-fetched. Like, what's the difference between finding a piece of art valuable and finding a social media post valuable. They're both files, they're both pieces of media. Um, and now with NFTs, they can be owned. Um, so, you know, I mean, it feels like a far bridge right now, but, you know, we've seen crypto art from 2018 to 2021 go from $50,000 in volume a year to two billion, right? I don't think anyone expected that. Um, you're seeing music go from a million dollars in 21 to 30 million in 2022. So, I mean, obviously a much smaller market, but it's just kind of expanding more and more into these other verticals, right? Uh, it's going into writing, it's going into videos, it's going into 
all these different things. Um, so yeah, imagine using your content to back alone. I love it. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Appreciate you all. Um, and yeah, we got to go, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can find me at Levy Chain on Twitter. Brett. Uh, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Ellie Farisi. And our company that Adam and I are building, again, is Bello at Bello Sites on Twitter. Yeah, follow Glass Protocol on Twitter. And you can follow us on uh, Instagram, Famecast. <laughs>